so that everyone can enjoy the ceremony, I ask that the graduates and guests turn off their cell phones at this time. Here now, in the presence of delegates from sister institutions, the administration and trustees from the State University of New York, members of the Stony Brook Council, the Stony Brook Foundation, public officials, faculty, administrators, students and staff, alumni and honored guests and friends of Dr. Samuel L. Stanley, Jr. and the State University of New York at Stony Brook, I hereby, I hereby declare this convocation convened. Welcome to the installation ceremony of Samuel L. Stanley, Jr., fifth president of Stony Brook University. Please remain standing for the singing of the national anthem led by Marianne Lemieux, a doctoral student in the Department of Music. Following the national anthem, the invocation will be delivered by, doc by Dr. Rabbi Joseph Topek from the Interfaith Center. In the words of the psalmist, today is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Today is indeed a great day, a day to celebrate Stony Brook and to be thankful for all that we have been given the merit to achieve. We are blessed with an institution that has achieved greatness as a place where every member of the community is cherished and respected. We have been blessed 
with great leaders whose vision and devotion have propelled us to this moment. We have been blessed with great teachers and researchers who in their devotion to their students and to the pursuit of knowledge have made countless contributions to human good. We have been blessed with wonderful students in whose discovery of the world around them we have all delighted. And today we are blessed to welcome a new leader who himself has been blessed with enormous ability, devotion to learning, commitment to healing, and the use of our divinely given abilities to change the world for the better. God, our creator, we ask that you grant our new president, Samuel L. Stanley Jr., wisdom and courage. May he lead this great institution of learning and research in its mission to educate and to discover and to inspire us all to realize our potential. May God bless the work of his hands and watch over him and his wonderful family and over our entire university that we may continue to be blessed in all of our work. Please be seated. It is my pleasure to welcome all of the university's special guests today. Today's guests include former Stony Brook presidents John H. Marburger, president from 1981 to 1994, and Shirley Strum Kenny. <laughs> and President Shirley Strum Kenny president from 1994 to 2009. I also welcome the Chancellor of the State University of New York, Nancy L. Zimfer. A special welcome to President Stanley's family, his wife, Ellen Lee, a faculty member from the School of Medicine and a part of the Platform Party. Also, his family sitting in the first row. <clears throat> Formal greetings will now be presented by those directly involved with Stony Brook's future. Representing the New York State Senate, the Honorable John J. Flanagan and the Honorable Kenneth P. Laval. Good afternoon, and thank you very much. And I, I just want to start off by saying that I can't be the only one. I got the whole chills up the spine listening to our singer do the national anthem. She was absolutely fabulous. And I did, I did look at the program like everybody else, and it is obviously very important to note the ascension of uh, Dr. Stanley as the president, but I also noted that there are 12 speakers. So I don't know if that could be considered trial by jury or cheaper by the dozen, but I think the order of the day is to be sincere and to be brief. So to Dr. Stanley, well, first of all, Madam Chancellor, it is absolutely wonderful to see you here, Dr. Marburger, Dr. Kenny, and to President Stanley, I had a chance to meet with the president a little while ago. We sat for about an hour and talked about a lot of different things. And in my mind, there are very basic things that are important to Stony Brook University in particular, but to any institution of higher learning, and frankly, if you're going to be an effective leader. In order to be an effective leader, fundamentally, you have to be a very good listener. And I found in the brief time that I've worked with Dr. Stanley that he's a very good listener. Second, we spend quite a bit of time talking about family. And he's going through it like many of us are. I have two kids in college. He has kids in college, kids in graduate school, children in high school. So he gets it. He understands what it all means. 
And I will close on this. I very much look forward to working with you on behalf of the Stony Brook community and Stony Brook University, and I wish you the absolute best luck in the world. Thank you. President Stanley, it's uh, a great privilege to be here today and with all of the members of the dais and individuals, faculty, students, and staff who are here today. I would like to um, note that um, you might want to consider the, the past and that the past serves as guidance for the present and that the present serves as an investment to the future. There are individuals, faculty, students, staff who come here every day. They are what has been part of every era, the dreamers, the idealists, the philosophers. Your job Dr. Stanley will be to ensure that your leadership will give them the direction, the encouragement that they need to continue to dream, to be the idealists and the philosophers. And when that happens, Stony Brook will continue to move forward. The die has been cast, I believe, that the next chapter is to focus on research and technology, and that will happen, and you will move this university forward. When that happens, each and every department, whether it be at the undergraduate level or on the East Campus, those programs will begin to rise and become an equal partner at this university. Good luck and Godspeed in your leadership here at a great university. Thank you. Representing the New York State Assembly, the Honorable Stephen Engelbright. Dr. Stanley, Chancellor Zimfer, distinguished members of the faculty and students, it is a great privilege to be a part of this extraordinary event and to be uh, able to bear witness to uh, the beginning of uh, the next chapter in the history of this great university <clears throat> and this university's role in the regional economy and in the destiny of all of its citizens. The premise and the promise of public higher education uh, has never been more important. We are understandably all aware of the very difficult times that our state and nation are going through. Never before have we been in need of great leadership and never before have I felt that that leadership uh, was uh, selected uh, so perfectly to match the challenge of the time. We are uh, clearly going to need your vision, uh, your sense of balance, and your sense of optimism. And all of that I have already had a chance uh, to sample, and uh, I am greatly encouraged. Uh, we are going to uh, pull uh, this university forward uh, and along with it uh, the future of this entire region and this entire state. I think that public higher education is the greatest invention of the American experience and that this university, uh, notwithstanding what some people may say about Buffalo or Binghamton or Albany, this is the flagship of the SUNY system. Dr. Stanley, you're the captain of our ship. God bless as you go forward. 
uh, you have our support and you carry uh, in uh, your forward momentum uh, our dreams and aspirations. Representing the Suffolk County Legislature, the Honorable Vivian Valoria Fisher. It certainly is a privilege uh, to be here with you today. Congratulations, Dr. Stanley, and greetings to Chancellor Zimfer and to the family. Congratulations to all of you, and welcome to Suffolk County. It is beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> During the time uh, that Dr. Stanley has been with us uh, since June, I guess, all of his credentials notwithstanding, I believe that all of the groups with whom he has met, and I, I can't think of any group with whom he has not met, uh, he's been very busy, have been impressed by what a quick study he is. Uh, he has really grasped so many of the issues that are important to us here in this community. He has listened and he has shared his ideas about those issues. We look forward to a great partnership with Dr. Stanley, the kind of partnership that we have looked for and developed throughout these many years here in the Stony Brook community. I look forward to working you doc with you, Dr. Stanley. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, spending time speaking with you one-on-one, -on -one, and as part of the many groups with whom you have met, uh, we look forward to many years of this partnership. Thank you very much, and good luck in everything you do. Representing the State University of New York Board of Trustees, Michael Russell and Carrie Stoller. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome Dr. Stanley and his family. Uh, it, it's, it, we're kind of uh, very lucky in that we have a brand new chancellor and a brand new president at the same time. And since there are no problems in New York State, it's going to be a very easy ride for the both of them. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I found interesting today at lunch, I talked to uh, Dr. Stanley's mom, and she told me that Sam was able to diagnose problems very easily. So I think that we know what the problems are. I think we just need uh, to help Sam fix them. And I hope that everybody in this audience is aware that we have, we're very lucky to have Sam Stanley as a president and have his family participate in this, and that we all are here to help him drive this university forward. Thank you. This is a wonderful moment for Stony Brook University. Many of you here have helped make Stony Brook a great university in just 50 years. You should be proud of your hard work and accomplishments. Now we confront the opportunity to make Stony Brook even more distinguished, but much hard work lies ahead. We're extremely fortunate to have Dr. Stanley leading this effort. He brings an outstanding combination of intellect, drive, and integrity to this challenge. Let us all work together with our new president to create an even better university. Please join me in expressing our appreciation to Dr. Ellen Lee. who has supported her husband's decision to lead Stony Brook. Dr. Lee, we welcome you. <laughs> Dr. Stanley, I am confident that I speak for everyone assembled here today when I wish you much success in the years ahead at Stony Brook. Representing the Stony Brook Council 
Its chair, Kevin S. Law. Good afternoon. It's been almost 30 years since I walked the campus here as an undergraduate. And I look back over the last, uh, it's been about 29 years actually, that uh, how lucky I am, how blessed I am, and how well this university prepared me for where I am today. And when I recently received a call from the governor asking him, asking me to become the chairman of the Stony Brook Council, I thought what a terrific way to give back to my alma mater, uh, a school that prepared me so well. And so I look forward to working with Sam Stanley uh, to bring the university uh, to the next level, to prepare that next generation of future leaders here on Long Island. And I really know he's going to do a great job. Um, I've had the pleasure of serving with Jack Marburger and Shirley Strum Kenny, and Stony Brook has such a great tradition of great presidents, and I know Sam is going to continue and lead us to the next level. So Sam, I wish you the best of luck, and I look forward to being a partner with you. Representing Washington University in St. Louis, the assistant to the chancellor, Robert Wilde. On behalf of Chancellor Mark S. Wrighton at Washington University in St. Louis, congratulations to President Stanley. Dr. Stanley left his post as Vice Chancellor for Research at Washington University after serving for three years in that important role. He was a distinguished member of the faculty, serving as a professor of medicine and molecular, that's hard to say, molecular biology for over two decades. All of us in the Washington University family were extremely proud and not at all surprised when we learned that Dr. Stanley would be assuming this important post for Stony Brook University. I'd like to briefly share with you today the resolution passed by Washington University's Faculty Senate Council on June 5th, 2009 in honor of Dr. Stanley. Be it resolved by a unanimous vote, the Faculty Senate Council recognizes Professor Samuel L. Stanley, Jr., MD, the Vice Chancellor for Research, for his outstanding service to Washington University and the faculty, Samuel St Stanley's leadership vision, talent, and dedication have improved significantly the research environment throughout the university and have greatly facilitated opportunities for faculty to pursue creative paths to discovery. We congratulate Samuel Stanley as he leaves to become the president of Stony Brook University of the State University of New York, a sister AAU institution. He leaves behind a talented and dedicated staff who will continue to serve the Washington University research community. President Stanley, thank you for your exemplary leadership at Washington University, and congratulations to you on your new role with Stony Brook University. Representing the graduate students, the president of the Graduate Student Association, Dylan Selterman. Dear President Samuel Stanley, on behalf of the nearly 10,000 graduate students at Stony Brook from the East, West, and Southampton campuses, both full-time and part-time, in programs ranging from music to medicine, welcome to the State University of New York at Stony Brook. I want to express on behalf of all grad students just how happy we are for you to be here with us today, the new president and leader of Stony Brook University. I know my time is short, so I want to emphasize two important things. First, I want to remind everyone just of the challenges it is to be a working grad student. It's easy to forget that many grad students here are paid employees of the school and the state of New York. Uh, many of us are teaching assistants, research assistants, and graduate students, uh, graduate assistants. We have a very substantial teaching responsibility, and we also work in terms of academic and scientific research. We attend conferences and present our work to the world, and we are very proud of what we do. When people say the power of Stony Brook is in research, education, and discovery, it's grad students they're talking about. And the second point I want to emphasize is 
that we want to reaffirm our strong commitment to service and dedication to making Stony Brook the best it can possibly be. Looking forward is my optimism and hope that we can work together. President Stanley, in your short time here, you've already demonstrated your recognition that grad students are a fundamental pillar of the research university. You have expressed your commitment to improving the quality of grad student education in addition to providing support for our work. In the coming months and years, as you begin to formulate roadmaps for Stony Brook and steer our ship towards greener pastures, I hope you will not hesitate to use GSO as a resource. Know that my colleagues and I are eager to learn from you and to collaborate with you. And I know that once we can take that first step, we can accomplish anything. Thank you, and once again, welcome. Representing the undergraduate students at Stony Brook, the president of the undergraduate student body, Jasper Wilson. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome President Stanley to the Stony Brook family, a family rich in tradition, intelligence, and diversity. Talking to my peers, it has become evident that the student body is very happy to have, to have you here and looks forward to being part of your forward-thinking administration. As a fairly new president myself, I know there's a lot we can all learn from one another, and I am grateful and humble to have the opportunity to learn from such an intelligent and accomplished man. Although we face many challenges together, I know President Stanley's unique and successful background will allow him to take Stony Brook University to new heights. This is a very important time in history for our university. And I want President Stanley to know all of us are here <clears throat> to help him and to help Stony Brook reach its new potential. The student body looks to partner with our new president to ensure that the best possible college experience for all students under the Stony Brook umbrella, in the classroom, around the campus, and in all our future endeavors. From one president to another, welcome. I'm not done yet. <laughs> Good luck, <laughs> and know we stand with you shoulder to shoulder to continue many successes in our, of our wonderful university. To ensure that you have everything you need and you have all the resources you need at your disposal, I'm willing to gratefully trade offices with you so that you can be at the center of campus at the SAC. <laughs> From all the students here at Stony Brook, Fun Young, bienvenidos, por las pilat, mechaba, and baruch haba. Welcome, and thank you very much for coming. Representing the Stony Brook Alumni Association, President-elect Gloria Snyder. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of the Alumni Association and our 130,000 alumni to officially welcome our new president, Dr. Samuel Stanley, to the Stony Brook University community and what a great community it is. My husband and I are both proud Stony Brook alums. Over the years, we've remained actively involved with Stony Brook's incredible community of talented students, scholars, and staff and it's been our pleasure to watch it evolve into a university ranked among the top 1% of the universities in the world. Dr. Stanley has articulated his mission to focus on research, education, and discovery, something Stony Brook is already hardwired to achieve. And it's an important next step in the evolution of our great research university. So I urge all alums whether you graduated last year or in the last 40 years, to offer some of your time, talents, or resources to help the scholars, researchers, doctors, and students who followed in your footprints. Today, more than ever, you can have a tremendous impact on our students, Stony Brook, and our collective future. And I can personally guarantee 
that when you reconnect with Stony Brook's amazing community, it will be one of the most personally rewarding things you'll ever do. Thank you. Representing the Stony Brook Foundation, the Chair, Richard Gelfand. Thank you and welcome to Dr. Stanley and his family. Besides chairing the Stony Brook Foundation, I had the great privilege of being the Vice Chair of the Search Committee that selected Dr. Stanley to be here at Stony Brook. And I'm proud to say that we met some of the greatest minds in the nation. Uh, people with all, sa all sorts of talents from all kinds of great universities. But Sam's intellect, his, um, his leadership skills um, just stood out. Um, if, for those of you who saw the movie Jerry Maguire, um, he had us from the word hello. Um, now, besides all of that, you may not be aware of Sam's greatest talent, which is his three-point shot. But when it came down to choosing the final candidate, he didn't even need that. He was so far out in front. So it's my pleasure to welcome Sam, Ellen, and their entire family to the university community. And all I could say is in our search, we saw great things, and we know he'll deliver great things. Thank you. Uh, we would like to recognize the presence in the audience of three of our state legislatures, Senator Brian Foley, Assemblyman Fred Thiel and Assemblyman Michael Fitzpatrick. And as President of the University Senate, my greetings on behalf of the University's faculty and staff with our promise to give a full measure of our commitment to our joint effort with President Stanley to sustain and enhance Stony Brook's role as a beacon for research and education. The Stony Brook Wind Ensemble will now play a musical interlude.
I have the privilege to introduce Chancellor Nancy Zimfer and to welcome her back to Stony Brook University after a 64 campus tour of SUNY that is indicative of her remarkable energy and enthusiasm in moving SUNY forward. In her role as Chancellor, Nancy Zimfer brings renewed optimism and great vision to one of the greatest comprehensive systems of public education in the nation. Her respect for the value of our research institutions in shaping the future of the great state of New York will enable Stony Brook University and our sister campuses to realize their extraordinary potential. We are pleased to have her leadership as an advocate and worthy champion for public higher education. Thank you and good afternoon. What uh, a stirring performance by the Stony Brook Woodwind Ensemble. Thank you again. Thank you. It is indeed a privilege to be here at such a celebrative and uh, ceremonial and ritualistic day. I think at the core of every great university are rituals that are of great importance and surely today is one of those days. Uh, this of course is not my first visit to Stony Brook University. I'm proud to say that I was here on the day when we welcomed uh, Sam Stanley to his presidency at Stony Brook sometime earlier this year. Uh, I was back for one of my 64 campus visits in midsummer. I think it was President Stanley's third day on the job. He was so knowledgeable, though, you would never have known this. And now, back again today. After logging 7,604 road miles in a Chevy Tahoe traveling the state of New York, I can honestly say that the State University of New York is a fantastic system. And the critical presence and role that Stony Brook University has played and will play going forward is so important to our future. This is a moment in time for the State University of New York, and as such, we called our 64 campus tour phase one of a strategic plan that will evolve and be presented to the people of New York in April 2010. Uh, this is a process that's very inclusive, and in fact, now that we are in phase two, we are holding statewide conversations. We will be back on Long Island to have one of those conversations, thanks to the hospitality of Stony Brook University. Of course, it got me thinking about what matters most to us, and I'm proud to say that this evolving strategic plan will focus on the revitalization of New York's economy and the enhanced quality of life of this great state. And what better asset to position itself as a driver, if not the driver, of that economic renewal than the State University of New York and Stony Brook University. It also got me thinking a lot about leadership. This is a day to celebrate leadership. And over the years, I've been crafting my own little theory of leadership, something that I aspire to and work on every day. It begins by suggesting that leadership is a function of vision and that vision trumps everything. A leader helps create that vision, but secondarily only at the hands of many. This is not something this accumulation of vision and aspiration that any single person can do without the hands of many. And of course, a vision crafted by the hands of many must result in action. We must do something. We must make a difference, and we must hold ourselves accountable to that action. And of course, it goes without saying that a good leader seeks constantly to provide the pocketbook for that vision. And we do that every day and every way. And a great leader constantly and tirelessly tells the story of a great institution. Members of the Stony Brook family, you have before you in Samuel L. Stanley, Jr., just that leader, president, of Stony Brook University. 
I would like to invite to the podium trustees of the State University of New York, Mike Russell and Carrie Stoller, if you will join me at the podium. And now I call forward Samuel L. Stanley, Jr. to please step forward. Dr. Stanley, the Board of Trustees has chosen you as President of the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Yours will be the privilege and the responsibility of leading Stony Brook to the fulfillment of its great promise for years to come. We are confident that the words inscribed on the medallion of office let us become all we are capable of being, will serve as a guide in shaping your actions and decisions. And now, by the virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I, Chancellor of the State University of New York, hereby install you, Samuel L. Stanley, Jr., as President of the State University of New York at Stony Brook, with all the rights privileges and responsibilities pertaining thereto, and I place over your shoulders the seal of the university, the symbol of the high office which you now hold. President On behalf of the State University of New York, I welcome you as the fifth president of the State University of New York at Stony Brook. I assure you of our confidence in you and pledge our support during your presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you the fifth president of the University of New York at Stony Brook, Samuel L. Stanley, Jr. Thank you so much. Uh, please, please sit. Um, I feel like just saying hello and, and sitting down, but um, obviously this is an extraordinary, extraordinarily memorable time for me, and I thank all of you for sharing what is, is really one of the proudest and, and happiest moments of my life. Um, I want to begin by a few thank yous. Um, this has been a wonderful ceremony so far. I'm, I'm really grateful to all of the speakers to date for their eloquence. Um, they really have, I think, uh, said obviously very wonderful things about me, but I also think they're saying wonderful things about Stony Brook, and I appreciate their confidence in this institution and their devotion and commitment to it. Um, a special thank you first to our Grand Marshal, the President of the University Senate, Michael Schwartz, for leading us this afternoon and for his introduction of many of the special guests who are with us today. Michael, thank you. And of course, I'm extraordinarily honored, and, and, and what a fantastic uh, thing um, to be able to have two of my predecessors up here on the stage with me, um, Dr. John Marburger III and Dr. Shirley Kenny. Um, yeah. I think it must be a, a really amazing experience for them 
um, to be on campus, to look out and see the faculty they helped recruit, um, to see the buildings that they helped build, to think about how far this campus has come in such a short period of time. Um, we really stand tall on their shoulders, and I thank you both for the gift of this great university. Thank you. I also want to personally acknowledge the members of our New York State Legislature who have been giants in championing Stony Brook University. Um, my special welcome to Senator Ken Laval, Senator John Flanagan, Senator Brian Foley, Assemblyman Steve Engelbright, uh, Assemblyman Fred Thiel, and Suffolk County Legislator Vivian Vivoria Fisher. Um, your past support has helped shape Stony Brook, and we look to your continued advocacy to secure our future. Thank you so much. I also want to extend uh, a welcome and congratulations to the new chair of the Stony Brook Council, Kevin Law, as well as the many members of the council here today. I look forward to working with this outstanding, accomplished group of men and women. Um, on a personal note, um, Kevin has already been a tremendous help to us um, and to Stony Brook. Please join me in thanking him for his commitment. Thank you. Uh, Assemblyman Mike Fitzpatrick, I forgot to mention uh, a great friend of Stony Brook. Uh, Assemblyman Fitzpatrick, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to extend my sincere gratitude to the former council chair, Rick Nasty, um, for the, all that he brought to Stony Brook, and especially thank him for the critical role he had in leading the presidential search. Although he could not be with us today, um, Rick's hand and heart are forever imprinted on his alma mater. Um, I want to thank also all the members of the Presidential Search Committee who are here today. Thank you so much. I want to extend my personal appreciation to the Chair of the Stony Brook Foundation, Richard Gelfand, and the Chair Emeritus, Jim Simons, and all of the members of the Stony Brook Foundation for all of their contributions to Stony Brook University. All of us are in your debt. Um, your vision and generosity has really transformed this university, and I thank you so much. And I want to do just a few more thank yous. Um, a warm welcome to Gloria Snyder, representing our Alumni Association. I thank all of the Stony Brook alumni for your devotion to your alma mater. Thank you. I want to thank our two student representatives, Dylan Selterman and Jasper Wilson, for so ably and I think humorously in some sense uh, representing their most important constituencies. Thank you. Thank you to Rob Wild, uh, representing Wash University. Um, I spent 20 years there. Um, I have extraordinarily fond memories. Um, the proclamation he read from the Senate um, meant so much to me. It was the first time in the history of the university, I believe, that the Senate has actually passed a proclamation for one of the administrators. Um, that was a tremendous honor. It doesn't happen too often, right? So it, it was a tremendous honor. And I, Rob, thank you so much for being here. We are fortunate to have two members of the SUNY Board of Trustees with us today. Um, Michael Russell, as you know, um, really has devoted his heart and soul to improving SUNY and Stony Brook, and his dedication to improving our academic medical centers has really been without peer. Um, Mike, thank you for all you're doing on our behalf. And Carrie Stoller, um, one of our most valued foundation members, an extraordinarily creative thinker and dedicated supporter, has now brought his wisdom and perspective to the SUNY Board of Trustees. Carrie, I thank you for all you've done and your willingness to help SUNY and Stony Brook move forward. Thank you. And I'm very grateful that the hardest working person in education, the, the James Brown of education, if you will, um, our new chancellor, Nancy Zimfer, could be here today. Um, I just made that up. Maybe I, sh I shouldn't have. Um, as, um, as we all know, um, these are challenging times. But, but SUNY could not have a better pilot to guide us through this storm than Nancy Zimfer. 
Yeah. She, she is a woman of courage and vision and has already demonstrated the kind of leadership that will help transform SUNY. We could not have a more determined and qualified person at the helm, and I am privileged to partner with her as we go forward. Welcome and thank you, Chancellor Zimfer. I want to extend a blanket thanks to all other members of, of the platform party. And I just want to acknowledge one more group of people, and that's a, a, well, one more group of, of non-family members. And, and that's all the members of my senior leadership team uh, who are here today, and especially our provost, uh, Eric Kaler. Um, I'm really honored to be part of such a dedicated and knowledgeable team. Thank you for all you're doing to Stony Brook, and I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Celebrating this kind of event um, is wonderful, but when you have a chance to be actually surrounded by your family, um, it makes it, of course, particularly special. Um, I want to begin by thanking my wife, um, Dr. Ellen Lee, um, whose support and encouragement have really made all the difference in my life. Um, one of the nice things about Mary to Ellen is that I know I've already made a significant contribution to Stony Brook just by bringing her here. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. And I really thank her for helping me fulfill my dream. Um, Ellen and I both worked as molecular biologists, and together we performed the most successful recombinant DNA experiment of all time. <laughs> Our four children. Um, <laughs> and, and, and also the most fun, actually, molecular biology experiment ever. Um, Jim. Susie, uh, Katie, and Sam. Um, Jim, Susie, and Sam are here today. Guys, why don't you uh, stand up? Um, thank you. Katie is uh, back at Stanford um, studying for a, a midterm, um, but hopefully she's taking some time out to watching this on the streaming video, and if so, Katie, I'm waving to you. Um, I think all of you who, who've had the uh, joy of, of having children know that um, each year they become more interesting, uh, more accomplished, and more expensive. Although I'm, I'm, although I'm hoping that will change soon. Um, I, I'm really so glad they're here today. I'm very proud of all that they do, and more importantly, the kind of young people they are. So thank you, guys. And I know how fortunate I am to have my parents, um, Sam and Janet Stanley, here to witness and enjoy this day. Um, I speak often of my parents, and as time has passed, I've come to recognize how much their experiences as an anthropologist and elementary school teacher form my lifelong love affair with knowledge and service. I'm very grateful for all of their love and support, and take this opportunity to thank them for everything they did to help me prepare for a very fulfilling life. Thank you, Mom and Dad. I have two wonderful sisters, Anne and Sarah, and they're here today with their very accomplished husbands, Dale Rogerson and Byron Thomas. I greatly admire both of my sisters. Um, each of them has chosen a life that contributes to others. Anne is an executive for the Casey Foundation. Sarah is a tireless community volunteer. Um, each are exceptional parents, and each have survived having a maybe occasionally overbearing and certainly at sometimes know-it-all and bossy big brother. Um, but, but our shared memories are always a source of joy and occasionally uncontrollable laughter. And I thank them for making this day so special for me. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Finally, I'm very pleased that Ellen's parents, Henry and Mary Lee, were able to join us today. Obviously, I thank them for Ellen. Um, thank you. But, 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 but also for the very important role they played in our careers and our children's lives. They moved to St. Louis. Um, and really became our emergency babysitters, laundry helpers, and, and kid event chauffeurs. And I really can't imagine how we would have managed two careers without them, and I'm very grateful for them help. Henry and Mary, thank you. So before I launch into my, my prepared uh, remarks, I, I want to begin with a, a very special message and, and maybe actually make a little history to, to, here today, um, a special message to our students and healthcare providers. Um, as a physician and infectious disease specialist, a parent, and a president, I, I really care about the health of our students, our faculty, and our staff. 
and the patients who entrust their health and life to our medical center. The dangers from the new strain of H1N1 influenza are real, and the disproportionate number of deaths when compared to the circulating seasonal influenza strains in young people, pregnant women, and people with underlying diseases is quite real as well. These are cold, solid facts, and the disruptive effects that outbreaks have had on other campuses is real as well. I was very encouraged when I saw the large number of students that came to the Student Activity Center to get vaccinated, and I urge all of those currently eligible to receive this vaccine to get it. And since I believe in actions more than words, I thought I would take this opportunity as an infectious disease physician to receive the injectable form of the vaccine right now. Um, <laughs> There'll be a little wardrobe adjustment, but don't worry, this is the kind you get in your arm, so it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. This is Maureen Pavone, who's going to do the honors, just so you know, from the Health Sciences Center. This is for real. That's oh, I know. It, it, it is the real thing. That was really well done. Yeah, I didn't feel a thing. Uh, need a new shirt, but that's okay. Right away. That's okay. No, that's no problem. Thanks. You know, this is the power of red, right? So, you know. <laughs> So 52 years ago, on October 4th, uh, a new object began orbiting the Earth. The world changed, and the concept behind Stony Brook was born. Sputnik became a symbol for scientific and technical supremacy and awakened the United States to the need for investment into science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education, and research. The State University of New York, SUNY System, under then Governor Nelson Rockefeller, responded by transforming a teacher's college on Long Island into a university one with a mission of excellence in science technology, founded to become a Berkeley for New York, to be a great public university. Its first president, John Lee, was appointed on January 1st, 1961. And this and the years before it were really what gave birth to Stony Brook University. The original strategy for building Stony Brook was simple. It was not about the buildings, it was about the people. From the beginning, it was about attracting top faculty. Within years of its founding, Stony Brook had attracted a Nobel laureate to its faculty. That was a statement. The caliber of the faculty defines the university. Plain, simple, and as true today as it was then. I will return to this theme in a minute, but it bears repeating. Stony Brook's goal was to become a great public research university. It is the scholarly and research activity of the faculty, its ability to generate and transmit new knowledge that creates the foundation for all of our endeavors. And that investment in astounding, outstanding faculty proved to be a very strong foundation for building a new university. Today we have the most honored and distinguished faculty in the SUNY system. Our faculty have been the recipients of the Nobel Prize in Medicine, Physics and Economics, and shared the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore for their work on climate change. Their scholarly activity encompasses the most important questions of our time. How did the universe begin? What are the origins of man? What does it mean to be human? How do we think? 
How do we achieve world peace? How do we deal with climate change and still meet energy demands? How do we improve human health and quality of life? Think about it. On any given day, Stony Brook faculty are searching for fossil clues to the origin of man and other primates in Kenya, interpreting data from an atomic collision at the relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven National Laboratory. They're at sea collecting samples to use forensic DNA analyses to stop illegal trade in great white sharks, restoring movement to a stroke victim by reperfusing their brain at Stony Brook Medical Center, developing new ways to transfer and store data to more rapidly diagnose heart attacks, searching for ways to expand understanding between members of the major religions in the world, evaluation interventions to reduce infant mortality in socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, pursuing a new insight into James Joyce, and creating an original screenplay. And this just scratches the surface. And of course, the wonderful thing about a research university is that we do this in harmony with our educational mission. Our students benefit from the opportunity to learn from the leading scholars in the field, but they also get the chance to experience firsthand the excitement and satisfaction that comes from discovery. It's research, it's education, it's discovery, it's the power of Stony Brook, it's the power of RED. Stony Brook faculty and students have helped develop and test quantum field theory, discover the agent of Lyme disease, identify distant galaxies, find a new mammalian species, and develop a, the technology behind magnetic resonance imaging, just to name a few from a long list. And every day in humanities and social sciences classrooms, our student makes new discoveries by applying critical thinking. They look at culture and gender sensitivity, ethics, politics, economics, history, philosophy, and human behavior. And they develop the tools that are necessary to become a good, productive, and effective citizen. But Stony Brook provides an education that will take you even beyond that. Our graduates become leaders that recognize obligations to others that go beyond the responsibilities of citizenship. They take seriously the value of human life and particular human lives, and they exhibit both universal concern and respect for individual differences. We are training future leaders. And we've not been stingy with the opportunity to receive a Stony Brook education. We've gone from 148 students enrolled in 1957 to nearly 25,000 today, with 16,000 undergraduates and 9,000 graduate students. Stony Brook now has 138,000 alumni, about 83,000 with a bachelor's degree, and about 55,000 with a graduate degree or certificate. Our students simply get better every year. And our undergraduate class of 2013 is the best in terms of SAT scores and GPA that we've ever had. They take advantage of economic offerings of three colleges, arts and sciences, business and engineering and applied sciences, and eight schools, dental medicine, health technology and management, journalism, marine and atmospheric sciences, medicine, nursing, professional development, and social welfare. An exceptional faculty and outstanding students deserve a great campus. Our main campus is transformed from the Mudville of the 60s to what is at once a spacious, serene, energetic, and truly lovely place capped by the solemn beauty of the Wong Center. And we're no longer bounded by our original 1,100 acres. We have gone east to Southampton and west to Manhattan to create new centers for learning. And we remain determined to use any and all means necessary to further our academic mission and develop programs of education and scholarship, programs of excellence that will benefit our students, faculty, and the public. Now that's the quick view of Stony Brook, the three-minute elevator speech, the executive summary. All of these things have been driven home to me during the first phase of my inauguration week marathon. I sat in the Staller Center, a true treasure of the campus and our community, joined by faculty, students, staff, and members of our community, and heard extraordinary performances from our music faculty and staff, including members of the Emerson Quartet. In the same building, I saw one example of the remarkable creativity and scholarship within our art department, and last night sat enthralled at our Southampton campus while Jules Pfeiffer and other contributors to our MFA program in writing shared their new work with the community, students, faculty, and staff. I toured a health fair at our medical campus, sponsored by all of our allied schools, and went to the Student Activities Center to learn about the many ways in which our students are giving their time, energy, and expertise to the community. I played basketball with the students. Um, including some of our student athletes, reminding me of the importance of our recreational facilities and the high quality, and I mean high quality in terms of the students they attract, of our athletics program. And finally, in the presidential lecture series, I've had the privilege of hearing some of the leading scholars in their field describe research that really puts Stony Brook at the forefront of some very important areas for our future. So let me sum up in this section how far we've come. Because of the efforts of the superb and dedicated faculty, an energetic and enormously talented student body, 
an accomplished and loyal staff, far-sighted and committed political leaders who have championed our cause, the citizens of New York who have funded so much of our efforts, and the outstanding stewardship of three great presidents who collectively led Stony Brook for more than 42 years, John Toll, who could not be here today, Jack Marburger, and Shirley Strum Kenny, Stony Brook has become one of the premier research in the universities in the world. I salute you and all you've accomplished. I now want to talk about Stony Brook and why it matters so much. I believe that Stony Brook University and the State University of New York have never been more important in the history of this state than they are right now. Let me say it bluntly. We are the best investment the state can make to address the economy and many of the critical issues that confront us today. Energy, climate change, health, social justice, globalization. Winston Churchill said a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. I am by nature an optimist, but we face some very hard facts. We are in the midst of the most serious economic crisis our country has faced since the Great Depression. New York, which built much of its economy on the financial markets, is facing record deficits. Even before this crash, there were signs that the economic leadership of the United States was eroding. The world's richest man is from Mexico. The tallest building is in Dubai. Shanghai will soon be hold, home to the world's largest carbon capture project. Bollywood is bigger than Hollywood. We cannot match China or India or many other countries for cost of production. Rather, we must compete in the arenas of innovation and productivity. This is the cornerstone of the new economy. This is what drives our need for a highly educated workforce. And this is one of the things that makes SUNY and Stony Brook so important for our future. Great research universities are a home for innovation and innovators. Innovation is defined as the creation of a new device or process resulting from study and experimentation. Study and experimentation. That's what we do. Um, and because we are universities, not just research institutes, we help create the next generation of innovators. We're not the only source, of course, but increasingly as the private sector pulls out of the research arena, Witness the disappearance of Bell Labs, um, the skunk works at Northrop's, the slashing of big pharma's budgets. Increasingly, research universities and higher education as a whole become more and more vital to our economic future. Who gets this? China for one, Singapore for another. Um, China has created 900 new universities uh, over the past two decades and made significant investments in its flagship schools. Yet public universities in the United States find themselves with reduced budgets and a significantly declining proportion of state support. And unfortunately, SUNY and Stony Brook are in that position. Stony Brook is currently dealing with more than $28 million of cuts we've had over the past two years. And we've yet to determine how much more we face from the recent $90 million cuts just announced by the governor. I want to be blunt again. Cutting SUNY's budget is fundamentally the wrong strategy. SUNY and Stony Brook are solutions to the economic crisis. We're not a quick fix but we're very much the long-term solution. And we're an absolutely vital part of what has to happen if New York is going to regain economic strength and really develop its quality of life. Why do I say this? If Long Island and New York are going to recover, we need a highly educated workforce. We need sites of innovation as well as more innovators. We need to create new companies and attract existing businesses to our region and state. And we need individuals who understand global markets and different cultures and can be effective in this flat world. We need new approaches to energy, climate change, health, and disease. And we and every other community need and want cultural and recreational activities that enrich people's lives, healthcare we can afford, and citizens who can think critically and who can see beyond shouting and demagoguery, the kind of debate that seems to characterize much of our discussion these days. Stony Brook and SUNY are ready, willing, and able to play a central role in creating the Long Island and New York of the future. We know that higher educational attainment correlates with increased worker productivity. At Stony Brook, we are educating New Yorkers, 85% of our students are in-state, to give them the skill sets for the jobs of the future. But what makes Stony Brook special is the kind of students we serve. More than 30% of our current students are Pell Grant eligible, which means family income under 60,000 annually. And we estimate that over Stony Brook's life, Nearly half of its graduates were Pell or TAP grant eligible, meaning that we are providing access to New York's poorest students. 
At Stony Brook, we're very proud to be a member of the AAU, the most prestigious organization of research universities in the world. But I'm particularly proud to say that among the 62 members of the AAU, public and private universities, only one institution educates a higher proportion of Pell eligible students than Stony Brook University. I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Many of our students are the first of their generation to go to college. Many are the sons and daughters of immigrants. Many are new arrivals to the United States themselves. I think we all know the numbers. A BA degree adds between $300,000 and $1 million to lifetime earnings over a high school diploma, while a master's in arts or a doctoral degree adds significantly more. Stony Brook is fulfilling its mission as a public university, providing a world-class education for deserving students, and we do it very well. Our graduation rates for our Pell eligible students are higher than for other students on the campus. When it comes to our students, we're not about elitism, we're about excellence. We're not about privilege, we're about potential. We're about helping these talented young people become important contributors to society, and that's what Stony Brook should do. But that's not the whole story about what our students mean to this region. More than 70% of our graduates stay in the Long Island and New York City area. This is huge. Between 2000 and 2008, Long Island lost nearly 146,000 people between the ages of 25 to 44 emigrated from this region. Imagine what that number would look like without the influence of Stony Brook. At a time when brain drain and the loss of future workforce are absolutely critical issues for Long Island and the state of New York, Stony Brook is a powerful anchor for our graduates in our region. Now, if we're truly to further innovation and grow the regional state economy, we have to grow and expand our research efforts. This is one area where numbers really speak for themselves, and the coin of the realm is external funding support. Every time we get money from the federal government for a research project, it's like starting a small business. We hire skilled workers, we purchase supplies, we add administrative support, and as we grow, we build new facilities. And of course, the fruits of our basic and applied research are the foundation for new technologies, new processes, company formation, and ultimately economic growth. Unfortunately, in recent years, Stony Brook's external funding remained relatively flat, while our peers grew significantly. While some areas in our research portfolio have been extraordinarily successful, others have not kept pace, including funding from the National Institutes of Health. The NIH is the largest provider of sponsored research support, and Stony Brook and its academic medical center must become more competitive in this critical realm. This is going to require investment in new faculty, in new facilities, and maximization of our clinical revenue, even in these very difficult economic times. I say today that I'm committed to making this happen, and I will find the resources and the leaders necessary to move life sciences and medical research at Stony Brook University forward to excellence. Thank you. And, and we will not have to go this alone. One of the bright spots on the horizon is the SUNY REACH program being developed by the four SUNY academic medical centers and the College of Optometry. This is a comprehensive program that is designed to really stimulate research at SUNY by leveraging our strengths in infectious diseases, neurosciences, cancer, and diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. This is potentially a transformative initiative that focuses on new faculty recruitment and shared infrastructure. All of the five schools in the Chancellor have already committed seed money to get this off the ground, and it represents a new way of doing business for SUNY. I want to thank, thank SUNY Trustee Michael Russell and SUNY Chancellor Nancy Vimfer, Zimfer for their leadership in developing and encouraging this program. Thank you. <laughs> Stony Brook is well positioned to take a national and international leadership role in several research areas. Stony Brook University won the privilege of managing Brookhaven National Laboratory, the only Department of Energy laboratory in the Northeast. With an extraordinary infrastructure, superb, superb faculty, including many with joint appointments, Brookhaven Laboratory is a terrific partner and resource. Pioneering research in imaging, nuclear physics, energy, nanotechnology, and the upcoming new second generation national synchrotron light source provide tremendous opportunities for Stony Brook and Brookhaven to grow together. Brookhaven's director, Sam Aronson, who, see, yeah, there he is there, Sam, um, and I are actively developing new collaborations that will mutually benefit each of our institutions. But we're not alone in moving research on Long Island forward. 
We are working with Bruce Stillman, the president of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, one of the world's preeminent private research institutions, to create a research alliance that will change the game for research on Long Island in New York and nationally. The talented faculty at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory bring cutting edge research in molecular biology, basic cancer research, genomics, and more to the table. Together, the three institutions have more than $750 million in annual external funding. And by collaborating together, leveraging current programs and infrastructure, identifying economies of scale, developing strategic hiring practices, and creating joint proposals for funding agencies that build on the unique capabilities of each institution, we will create a powerhouse. Stay tuned in the next few weeks for further announcements about the Alliance and what it could mean to the economy of Long Island and New York. This is another area that will need investment, but let me say now that I think the Alliance represents a tremendous opportunity to move Long Island and New York forward. Thank you. The state made a very important investment in innovation at Stony Brook and in Long Island's economic development when it allocated the funds for two important buildings at our new research and development park. Our Center for Excellence in Wireless and Information Technology is a beautiful building and a remarkable interdisciplinary research hub where engineers, physicians, mathematicians, physicists, and biologists come together to apply the latest technologies and algorithms to critical problems in medicine, energy, communications, data storage and analysis, imaging, and much, much more. See what does not just house faculty and students. Young entrepreneurs, including Stony Brook graduates, are getting the opportunity to develop their business in proximity to outstanding scientists and mentors. I have to mention that my spouse, Ellen Lee, a biochemist and gastroenterologist by training, found the atmosphere at Seawit so stimulating that she actually stole an office and is now squatting there uh, on the premises. Um, and to Yaakov Shamash, uh, our head of uh, economic development and, and the guru behind Seawit, um, Yaakov, you're allowed to evict her if you want, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and, and next door, our Advanced Energy Research and Technology Center is pushing towards completion. We're striving for a LEED Platinum Certified Building, um, which would house which will house many of our efforts towards developing the next generation of batteries funded by a large frontier grant from the Department of Energy, improving existing and identifying new renew renewable energy sources, and improving the efficiency and environmental impact of conventional sources. Both CWIT and the Advanced Energy Research Technology Center are at the heart of our Smart Grid Consortium. This is a remarkable partnership of public and private utilities, top corporations, the city and state of New York through several agencies, Brookhaven National Laboratory, and public and private universities, including SUNY Buffalo and Stony Brook. And it's designed to drive research and generate innovative approaches to the critical problem of improving power delivery. The Smart Grid Consortium is an inspired concept, and I think provides a blueprint for how academia, industry, and the state need to collaborate together to push our research agenda forward and more effectively compete against other states for federal funding. We're very proud to be a leader in the Smart Grid Consortium, and we think it will make a difference to New York and the world. Few institutions are better prepared to deal with the issues surrounding climate change, the environment, and our oceans than Stony Brook. We are New York's Sea Grant Institution, and whether it is global warming and the associated risk of sea level rise, shore erosion, alterations in the ocean nutrients, or sustaining fish populations, scientists from our School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences are leaders in this field. To state the obvious, Long Island is an island, and New York City is a port, making research in this area absolutely key to our future policy, planning, and interventions. It's hard for me to imagine a more important area of inquiry in terms of this region's future. Environmental issues, public policy, natural resource management, ecological diversity, GIS, communications, and marine science are front and center at our new Southampton campus. This is a truly unique place where students live what they learn with real world projects in renewable energy, recycling, landscaping, and engagement in green design and programs. Under Dean Mary Pearl's energetic leadership, the campus continues to grow and evolve, working to become a valued asset for Stony Brook, SUNY, and our Long Island community. Globalization. <laughs> Globalization is not new, but is increasingly realized in all of our spheres of activity. Banks in Iceland failed because subprime loans in Arizona collapsed. SARS contracted in China within Toronto within days, and radiologists in India now read x-rays for patients in Palm Beach. Stony Brook has long been an international university. 
We were among the first to partner with Chinese universities, and we continue today to attract some of the best international students in the world to our campus. Students from 105 countries are here, and they add greatly to our academic and campus life. Because we are such a diverse and student body, our international students have a chance to see firsthand the wonderful cultural and ethnic tapestry to this the United States, while educating us about their culture and experiences. I'm particularly excited about exploring what we're doing now, exploring the potential of creating a new campus in Korea. It fits very well with our commitment to being a global university, and I think has tremendous potential in increasing our ties with one of the fastest growing and most important areas of the world. Stony Brook is a university, and SUNY as a system should be leading the way in, attaching, in attacking globalization in the most positive way possible. And again, we look forward to the strategic planning and Chancellor Zimfer in leading us in this area. I've spent a long time talking about this, but Stony Brook is doing really amazing things, and we do matter in so many different ways. Our physicians and hospital provide medical care for many Long Islanders and truly have become home to the best ideas in medicine. I can't tell you how many people have come to me to tell me a story about the experience of a loved one or even their own experience with Stony Brook University Medical Center, our Veterans Hospital, or our Long Island Veterans Home. These stories almost invariably end with profound thanks to someone who restored them to health, perhaps literally saving their lives or their mobility, their livelihood, or their independence. This undoubtedly reflects my bias as a physician, but to me nothing is more valuable than health, and I'm proud to lead the dedicated physicians, nurses, and health sciences staff who deliver high quality and compassionate care to so many Long Islanders. I salute you. I want to conclude this section about why Stony Brook matters by talking in more detail about our economic impact. We're the largest single-site employer on Long Island with more than 12,000 full-time employees. And these are high-paying jobs with mean salaries of over $76,000 annually compared to the Long Island average of approximately 48,000. Our annual operating budget is now nearly 1.9 billion, billion with a B dollars, with about two-thirds of that allocated to our medical center, and that figure is matched by revenue generated from those operations. In a study done using 2007 numbers, our economic impact on Long Island was estimated to be about $4.65 billion annually. We think now it's about $4.9 billion and nearly 60,000 jobs. Put another way, one out of every 12 jobs in Suffolk County is dependent upon Stony Brook University. But the really amazing figure comes when you look at return on investment. Stony Brook state allocation is approximately, with our recent budget cuts, about $300 million. That translates to a return on investment of about 1,600%. Or put differently, for every $1 invested by the state, it gains $16 in economic output. Now, my son is training to be a lawyer, um, and my favorite legal Latin term is res ipsa locator, the thing speaks for itself. For every $1 invested, $16 back to the economy. Res ipsa locator. So Stony Brook matters. It's central to economic development and the quality of life of this region and the state. The wonderful thing and the reason I came to Stony Brook is we can do even more. You've built the foundation to fulfill our destiny and become the great research, found, re, great research university that our founders dreamed of 50 years ago. I know each of us, faculty, students, staff, and alumni, all want to reach that goal. I want to put out four things now that we will need to be successful, four for our future. First, we must return to a strategic vi vision that has as its core the recruitment and retention of outstanding faculty. John Toll had it right. It all begins with great faculty. At Stony Brook, we have a budget crisis, but we also have a faculty deficit. Compared to the other schools in the AAU, the group we proudly call our peers, we're at the bottom in faculty-student ratio. Our enrollment increases over the past years, designed both to improve our accessibility by giving more students the opportunity to have a Stony Brook education and to increase revenue, have unfortunately not been able to be matched by increases in faculty. We need to remedy this now. There is a tipping point 
where large classes and recitation groups hinder the educational process, and where the inability to provide classes delays the ability of students to graduate. Our students deserve more. But equally important, I expect our faculty to engage in outstanding scholarly work that obtains external funding support, innovative work in the sciences, humanities, social sciences, fine arts that will help transform our economy and our quality of life. This is absolutely essential to our success and our commitment to the future of, the, of this region and the state. But that requires protected time, time away from teaching and administrative responsibilities. So let me be specific. My number one priority is to recruit more than 400 faculty over the next eight to 10 years. This level of recruitment would bring us into the middle of the AAU peers in our terms of faculty-student ratio. And I know that the existing Stony Brook faculty, who've done so much with so little sometimes over the history of the university, will outperform their peers. And over this period, I'm going to strive to create 40 new endowed professorships designed to help us recruit and retain outstanding faculty. This is going to be a focal point of my fundraising activities. But I want to be very clear about one thing. Um, this will not just be a process of simply filling vacancies. We have to be strategic. We have to identify those areas where Stony Brook can lead scholarship, where we can develop programs that differentiate us from other universities, those nascent or burgeoning areas that can transform a field. I think of our new Simon Center for Geometry and Physics, where we're bringing together leading faculty in mathematics and physics to look at the interface of geometry and theoretical physics, interdisciplinary, innovative, unique, and potentially transformative. So we're going to focus on building from existing strengths, taking good to great, but where necessary, and when their story is compelling, we will develop new programs. I think of an example of our Turkana Basin Institute, a cornerstone of Stony Brook's efforts to be at the forefront of understanding the human story. Again, it's interdisciplinary, innovative, unique, transformative, and global in its scope and benefits. And as we recruit new faculty and develop new programs, we will work with our partner schools in SUNY and the Alliance members, Brookhaven National Laboratory and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, to ensure that we are leveraging our tremendous resources and not duplicating programs. I think of a new program in biological imaging, one that would build on strong programs at Stony Brook, Brookhaven National Laboratory, Cold Spring Harbor, the New York Blue Supercomputer, and the new National Synchrotron Light Source 2, which when complete will be the world's brightest and most intense light source. New imaging processes often lay, new imaging approaches often lay new pathways to discovery and create or transform fields. The microscope made possible microbiology. The telescope transformed astronomy. The MRI changed neurology. Stony Brook and its partners could be at the forefront of new imaging approaches that will illuminate fundamental biological processes, ranging from the role of individual atoms in physiology to watching the mind work. So we will recruit, but it will not be business as usual. It will be cluster hiring, identifying outstanding faculty that will impact more than one department, whose work will bring together faculty and students across departments, schools, and campuses. It's not just about the sciences. Innovative programs in the humanities, in the social sciences, and fine art will be subject to the same targeted investment. Not every de Not every department may be able to grow, I'm going to be honest, but every department, faculty, and students will benefit, and SUNY, Long Island, and New York will be all the stronger. Of course, many things follow from this course of action. We will need resources to provide the infrastructure necessary to allow our strengthened faculty to successfully pursue their scholarly work. And let me make one thing perfectly clear. While I've put faculty at the front of this process, this is also absolutely about our students. Great faculty attract great students. Great students attract great faculty. We will not have one without the other. So we will need to provide additional resources to help recruit and support the graduate students that are so vital to the research and education mission of this university. And the same holds for our postdoctoral students. Bringing to campus outstanding faculty and improving the quality of both education and resource will also help us continue to attract outstanding undergraduate students from New York and beyond. We will want to expand our undergraduate research programs, one of Stony Brook's great strengths, to take advantage of the amazing intellectual capacity, energy, and drive of our great students. And I also want to make it clear that part of attracting great students is maintaining the outstanding infrastructure of student support services, tutoring, mental health, 
career guidance, and programs like EOP that show students, parents, and the public that we truly care about each Stony Brook student. We want them to succeed, and we're going to do everything possible to help them reach their potential. And to every extent that I can, we need to continue our efforts to make the quality of life on our campus a plus and not a minus. It's not hard to be positive when you see thousands of cheering students at Laval Stadium for Stony Brook football or lacrosse, or experience what I call enthusiasm personified, the Stony Brook Marching Band. And, and Wolfie, um, you know, there will always be a budget line for Wolfie, um, no question. I, I, I also want to use this moment to acknowledge our great staff. Um, sometimes they're not always uh, acknowledged in this kind of, uh, uh, of speech. Um, but they're so vital um, to everything that we do. Um, they're our partners in supporting our students, um, our faculty, our patients at the medical center. And they play a critical role in so many of the activities of the university, fundraising, facilities, communication, and so much more. Join me in thanking our staff. Now, second out of our four, and it's an essential component of the first priority, um, we need to find Stony Brook rules of engagement moving forward. What do I mean by that? I mean focus, focus, focus. Where do we invest? Where do we put our human and capital resources? To do that, we must be able to articulate our definition of a successful program, a productive initiative, an outstanding school, and ultimately a great research university. We need to establish the metrics for success, and we need to hold our leaders, including me, responsible for performance. Central to this process will be a strategic plan that begins with a careful review of all of our academic programs, our support services, our administrative structure, and all of our off-campus activities. The current budget crunch makes this absolutely essential, but it will also be extraordinarily valuable as we move forward. We are fortunate that we can do this planning in conjunction with the development of the SUNY Strategic Plan. I'm pleased to be a member of the steering committee for the plan and I thank for the SUNY Strategic Plan and I thank Chancellor Zim for including me in this vital activity. Nancy, thank you. One planning process will inform the other and we anticipate that the SUNY plan may help us identify some areas where Stony Brook programs might be better sited elsewhere and areas of need that Stony Brook needs to serve for the system. I used to say that no university, except maybe Harvard, could be great in all areas. And now after the financial crisis, I say no university can be great in all areas. Um, we, must, we must be focused and strategic if we're going to survive the present and build for the future. Some of you are probably wondering how in the world can I propose fixing our faculty deficit and pushing forward to greatness in the midst of our current budget woes. I do believe the budget crisis will eventually resolve. I do believe this is short term and our long-term future is bright. But I am less certain about the long-term ability of the state to maintain its level of support. Therefore, if we are to become a great research university, we need greater flexibility in all of our financial affairs. The current situation where state support continues to erode, yet we are unable to increase revenue through rational increases in tuition or easily engage in creative public-private partnerships is simply not sustainable. If the state cannot maintain its support for SUNY, and it's fallen consistently over the past decade in constant dollars, then it must unshackle us from the rules and regulations that hinder our chance to be great. Without relief, we run the risk of becoming mediocre. And the lofty goals of our original founders, Stony Brook as a great research university, will be forever deferred. We need SUNY Flex. The plan now proposed for the six research intensive universities, Stony Brook, Buffalo, Albany, Binghamton, Upstate and Downstate Medical Centers, that would allow the SUNY Board of Trustees to set tuition increases within a defined range and would keep all of the increased tuition revenue at the campuses. Currently, our tuition is nearly the lowest of all the schools within the AAU, and our out-of-state tuition is lower than the in-state tuition for many of our public, public, not private, public peers. 
But more importantly, and this is the most important thing, our tuition is too low to allow us to provide the best education for our students. And a plunge to mediocrity will only decrease the value of a Stony Brook degree, both in terms of the job market and acceptance into post-baccalaureate programs. We cannot allow this to happen. There are absolutely two components to Stony Brook, to how Stony Brook would implement SUNY Flex, and I want to emphasize them here. And they're part of a compact we need to make with our students, uh, their parents, uh, and the state. First, we would ensure that our most economically disadvantaged students would be held harmless by any tuition increase. We would do this by placing a proportion of the increased tuition revenue into scholarship funds for our needy students. We estimate that somewhere around one-third or two-fifths of the money would be used this way. Second, we will be completely transparent about the use of the increased revenue and pledge that it will be used for items that directly improve the education of our students. First on this list would be faculty recruitment, since it will lower class sizes and provide more research opportunities. <laughs> SUNY Flex would be transformative for us and the other research institutions. This is an idea whose time has come. This is what Stony Brook and the other research centers need to move forward. So I've talked about faculty and students, focus and flexibility. I want to close by talking about one more F word philanthropy. Um, we've been very fortunate, Stony Brook, to have a number of visionary friends whose generosity has really transformed this institution. Their names can be found on some of our most important structures. They're linked to some of our most valuable faculty members through endowed professorships. They help make the dream of a Stony Brook education a reality through scholarship programs. And they underwrite so many of our most important activities. I think I speak for all of us now when I say to those most generous supporters, thank you for believing in Stony Brook, and thank you for helping to make our vision of Stony Brook a reality. Thank you to all of the members. In conclusion, and I know you've been waiting for those words, um, I stand before you today proud to be the fifth president of Stony Brook University. We are young and vibrant, and we stand for all that is best about public universities. We are a home for research and innovation, a center for learning and scholarship, a champion of the arts, a center for outstanding and compassionate health care, an engine for economic development, and the creator of a pathway for upward mobility for the best and brightest and most diverse students. Our fundamentals are strong but we now must weather a perfect storm of reduced state support, a difficult climate for philanthropy, and re very real restrictions on our ability to obtain new revenue. Yet never, never has Stony Brook and SUNY been more important to this region and this state than now. I ask all of you, our faculty, our students, our staff, parents, friends, supporters, legislative leaders, and inform members of the public to unite together in common cause, to renew the promise of our founding, to work to give us the tools to become the great research institution this region and state so desperately needs. Together we can do this. Together we will do this. My thanks to you all. I think maybe we're all breathless from that speech. <laughs> um, 
We are privileged to have on the podium today Peter Winkley, P Peter Winkler, professor of music, who composed the Stony Brook alma mater many years ago, and a new piece that we will hear today for the first time. Peter? The new piece, Stony Brook Fanfare, will be played by the Stony Brook Wind Ensemble and directed by Bruce Engel. And now please rise for the singing of the alma mater. <laughs> 